Hi, welcome back to The Well. Uh, today's topic is going to be God is with you in the valley. It's a teaching that I think would be really helpful if you find yourself walking through a difficult situation or someone you know would be great to share with. So the verse I'm going to be using primarily comes from 1st of Kings chapter 20. I'm only going to read one verse for now and then we'll see some of the other verses in the chapter and it's going to be verse 23 from the NIV version. It says, Meanwhile, the officials of the king of Aram advised him, Their gods are gods of the hills. That is why they were too strong for us. But if we fight them on the plains, surely we will be stronger than they. So again, I just want to repeat the theme of this teaching is God is with you in the valley. And so first, before I talk about the valley, I just want to mention a few things about the mountain. Hills also could be a synonym for what I'm talking about with mountain. So when you think of a mountain, if you Google a picture of success or victory, often you'll see someone at the top of a mountain with their hands lifted up. You could think about Moses and the battle they had against Amalek, where he was with his hands lifted up at the top of the mountain, and they were in victory while his hands were up, so much so that he had to get Aaron and Ur to help him hold his arms up. And that's a great symbol of victory. Also, a mountain could be a symbol of refuge and protection. It is commonly known that military operations, they are often determined by the terrain. In ancient times, just as modern times, the terrain determines the tactics and strategies for an army. In Israel, the mountainous landscape has been an obstacle for centuries, and this has prevented foreigners from invading many times. Conquerors have occupied the plain lands instead. They avoided the mountains. Therefore, mountains have been a place of refuge and an overall defense system for the people of Israel. So then we see a mountain can be victory, mountain can be fulfillment of a promise, a mountain can be achievement of a goal, mountain can just be the best moment of your life. You're living your best life, you're on top of the mountain. Whereas the valley could seem like total opposite. The valley itself has many symbols. And interestingly enough, the definition of a valley is simply the geographical space between mountains. So what's from mountain to mountain? A valley. And so there are four valleys that specifically I want to talk about. And before I do, I want you to consider the phrase, the valley of. And how would you finish that phrase? The valley of. Maybe you said the valley of shadow of death. And that is one of the valleys. But I also have here the valley of dry bones. That's found in Ezekiel chapter 37. So a valley can be associated with a dry desert place. There is the valley of Accor, which the word Accor means trouble, affliction. Other definitions given are gloomy and dejected. In the book of Joshua 7, if you don't know much about this valley, it's where, sadly, Achan with his family were executed. Because Achan, under the command of Joshua, when they were going to conquer different territories, he was. they were all specifically told not to take anything. And Achan said he coveted the treasures, he coveted the spoils, and he took some. And then so they lost the next battle. And the people of Israel suffered because of this one man's sin. So God then had him stoned and burned his whole him and his whole family in the Valley of Achor, which is called the Valley of, in Spanish we say, Turbacion. There are other valleys that the Bible talks about. I have two more. It's the Valley of Baca, which in some translations it will call it the Valley of Weeping or the Valley of Tears. That's in Psalm 84, verse 6. And lastly, the most commonly known valley is the Valley of Shadow of Death. And depending on the translation, it'll also call it the deepest, darkest valley. It is often difficult to believe that we are in victory in the valley. This makes me think of Psalm 121, where he said, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? If he's lifting his eyes up to the hills, that means he's physically in a valley and he is in need of help. It's often associated that in the valley, we are in need. So this, so the psalmist says, where does my help come from? And before we get to his response, I want to go back to where we first started reading. Because where we first started reading is a battle that the people of Israel are having with the king of Aram under Benadad. And the king of Israel this time was King Ahab. And King Ahab is alerted by a prophet to say that there is an army, it's King Benadad, he has 32 kings aligned with him, and they are rising up against the people of Israel. However, in verse 13, a prophet alerted the king that God would give this vast army into their hands. 
And it said that they will know that he is Lord. So the people of God will know that he is Lord. Because it didn't matter how big this army was. If God was going to fight for them, then they were going to win the battle. So the king of Israel advanced and overpowered the enemy. And in 1 of Kings chapter 20, verse 22, the prophet warns the king, King Ahab, and he says, Strengthen your position and see what must be done. Because next spring, the king of Aram will come and attack you again. Strengthen your position. He's alerting him. See, many times when we want to hear a word from God, we want to hear that this year is going to be a year full of blessings. This year, God is going to exceed our expectations. And surely it can be that. But what if the word for God for you this year is strengthen your position and think about what must be done? Because around this time next year, you're going to be attacked again. I know that God alerts us. I know that the Holy Spirit often warns us. And there's some people who might say, don't speak that. Don't speak that into existence. But if the Lord alerts you that a battle is coming, that you need to be strong, that you need to take courage, that you need to be ready. I say that that's as powerful a word as a word saying God is going to unleash blessings over your family. So here we have the people of God receiving a message that they're going to be attacked again. And verse 23 says, Meanwhile, the officials of the king of Aram, so these are the officials of the king. These are the enemies, and this is what they have to say. They said, their gods are gods of the hills. That is why they were too strong for us. But if we fight them on the plains, or in other words, if we fight them in the valley, surely we will be stronger than they. Surely. Of course, they only won because their god is the god of the hills. So if we change our position, if we change where we are located, then surely we're going to win. Then verse 25 emphasizes the same idea, the enemies speaking, saying, So we can fight Israel on the plains, then surely we will be stronger than they. What is the lesson that we can learn from the enemies of God? And honestly, you'll see that it's something that we have to deal with in our everyday lives also. They thought that Israel won due to a geographical position. They thought that Israel won because their conditions were such. Because of some external circumstances, that's why they thought they won. They literally thought that their God would not be present in the valley. Why would they think that? Why would they think that a God so powerful to overcome such a vast army would only be in the hills? Are you seeing this already? Why do we often think? Why do we often think that God is with me when everything is going great, but when things don't seem to be going my way, when I'm in a dry place, when I'm in a dark place, when I'm in a place of trouble, when I'm in a place of tears? Those are the valleys we talked about. It often feels like I'm defeated. I'm alone. God is not with me. And just like we said that mountains were a really a defense mechanism against the enemy, well, if you're, think about it, if you are physically located in a mountain, you do feel like you have coverage. You feel like the enemy can't see you. And when you're in the valley, it feels like you're an open target. It feels like you're vulnerable. So I want you to think about a spiritual valley, an emotional valley. It could even be something due to a physical condition in your body. Whatever it is that takes you to what we consider a low place. And that is often a place where we are very vulnerable. And the enemy has the same mentality. I'm going to catch you in your low point. I'm going to catch you when you're down. I'm going to catch you when you're sad. Because if I catch you there, surely I will be stronger. Surely I will overcome you. And this is where we have to declare, as David did in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, the same God who took me to green pastures, the same God who led me to still waters, the God who had led me to the paths of righteousness, in other words, into the right path, the God who took me in the right path, it says, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, or even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not fear. And why won't I fear? Because you are with me. You were with me in the pastures. You were with me in the waters. You were with me along the path where I wanted to be. And guess what? You're with me in the darkest valley also. Psalm 46, a very special psalm also. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, although the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. This emphasis that my help is not going to come from the mountains. It's the same thing we saw in Psalm 121. 
because I don't know if I answered the question, but that's what he said. Shall I look up to the hills? Where does my help come from? And it says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's where my help comes from. In Psalm 46, God is our refuge. The mountain's not my refuge. The resources I have are not my refuge. The mountain could symbolize so many things in our life. It could be a friendship. It could be a job. It could be your bank account. It could be doctors. It could be your lawyer. It could be anything that you feel like is the solution. And you know what? God can use who and what he wants to help you in whatever situation. However, it is God the one who's doing. He's just using what he wants to use. Therefore, our trust needs to remain in him at all times. So then we see it is a mistake. It is a big mistake to think that we are alone in the valley, that we are defeated in the valley. Second Kings chapter 20 verse 28 says, The man of God came up and told the king of Israel, This is what the Lord says, because the Arameans think that the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valleys. I will deliver this vast army into your hands and you will know that I'm Lord. So I thought that was even interesting. And it's not so they'll know I'm Lord because it's all started because the Arameans, the enemy said, we'll win if we go to the valleys. But guess what? God is not interested in showing his enemies right now who he is. He wants his people to know. I was with you in the hills and I'm going to be with you in the valley. So guess what? I'm going to allow them to come attack you again because they think they're going to catch you vulnerable. They think they're going to catch you down and out, but I'm going to be with you. And through this whole experience, you're going to know that I am the Lord God. That's what he said. That's what God had to say about the matter. God allows us to go through valleys. Number one, obviously, as we saw, so he can show us who he is. He teaches us maturity. Patience, another word for patience is long-suffering, perseverance, my faithfulness to him. Will I be faithful in the valley? Will I maintain my eyes up towards the hills when I'm not feeling like I am in my victory, when I'm not feeling like I'm seeing God's fulfillment, God's words coming to be true? God takes us through the valley to depend on him. We emphasize that it's not the mountain, that it's not any external factor. It's not a condition. It is God himself. He is the answer. He is my refuge and he is my strength. Psalm 46 says he is an ever present help. That means he's always there. But interestingly, Psalm 46, 5, and I want to share that verse with you. And before I read verse 5, I just want to mention the context. Verse 4 prior speaks of a city. It says there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So the, the reference is a city of God. But I want to change the reference here, and I want you to see yourself in verse 5. Not a city, but a person. Specifically, a female, because that's what it uses in the feminine version, because city originally is a feminine noun. And verse 5 says, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. God is within her. She will not fall. She will not be moved. God will help her. And you might think, wait, we said God is an ever-present help. And also, God will help her. Is he helping me now or will he help me? And I learned this lesson not that long ago. My son being so young, only six months, the doctors told us it's time to stop giving him milk at night. And so the idea is we're going to let him cry it out if you've heard of this. And so at night, he's hungry, he wakes up, he starts crying. Well, I can go in, I can check, I can make sure everything's okay, but I'm supposed to walk right back out. See, I'm available to him. I'm alert. I hear his cry. I know that he feels that he needs something. But if I honestly have evaluated the situation and I see that there's nothing that needs to be done because he needs to grow, he needs to mature, so then he has to cry it out. He might feel like I'm not there, but I am there. I'm watching and I'm listening. But in the right moment, when, I, when it needs to happen, I'm going to step right in. And that's what I learned. Like God is an ever-present help but he will help me. I want to revisit some of the valleys that we mentioned and specifically the outcome that God has brought forth. Number one, the valley of dry bones. God has a conversation with the prophet Ezekiel. This is all found in Ezekiel 37. And he asks him, can these dry bones live? And the prophet says, only you know God. Like, ask yourself, can this situation be rectified? Is there a solution? You know, can 
this marriage live again? Can this friendship, can this job, like, can all of these things, can I ever have a child? Like, there's so many, you put yourself in there. Can what seems like it's not going to work, work? Can it? It's like, only you know, oh God, only you know. And then the Lord said in verse 5, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come back to life. That is amazing. He says, I will make these dry bones come back to life. So the valley that was once full of death became a valley full of life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Do you believe that God can resurrect even dead things? The valley of Achor, this was the valley where sadly Achan was executed with his family. And so this valley reappears in the Bible, although it was once trouble and affliction. In the book of Hosea, the Lord speaking to his people as an adulterous woman. In chapter 2, verse 14, he says, I am now going to allure her, lead her into the wilderness, and speak tenderly to her. Verse 15 says, There I will give back her vineyards, and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. It was once trouble, and it will now be a door of hope. The valley of Baca, or the valley of weeping, the valley of tears. Psalms 84, 6, in the Good News Translation, it says, As they pass the dry valley of Baca, or the dry valley of tears, it becomes a place of pools. A dry place can become a place of pools. It's saying that God can restore, God can bring life, God can bring joy, God can bring refreshment. And lastly, we said the valley of shadow of death. Why won't I fear? Because the Lord is with me. In conclusion, I want you to remember a few things. No one lives on top of the mountain. Life is a cycle. You go through the valley, you climb up the mountain. And let me tell you, that climb is a journey, and that climb is a whole nother conversation in itself. But eventually, you get to the top, you have victory, you see the fulfillment of what God has spoken over your life. And then you come down. Coming down is a separate conversation. But then you come down, you go through another valley, and back up another mountain. Someone once said, you're either in a trial, about to go in a trial, or coming out of a trial. The valley wouldn't be that different if we called it a desert, if we called it a fire. It's basically the place that none of us want to be. So when you find yourself in a valley, be encouraged. Because all that means is, you're on your way to your next mountain. God bless you. Please keep this word and I pray that you return back next week for more teachings. God bless you.